So today I'm going to talk about the Galton board, how it works, sort of the basics and the basic principles of how the Galton board works, which by the way is this thing here. I'm going to be talking about, yeah, the basics of how it works in order to show you how to simulate it. I thought since I know a lot about it, I might as well make a video on it. So this is the Galton board here as I showed you. So the Galton board is this device or toy sort of thing invented by Sir Francis Galton. Well, you have this array of pegs and this little container of beads at the bottom, which will soon become the top once I flip it. At the bottom, you have these bins. And so when I flip, make sure I got this right way around. When I flip it, you'll see that the beads fall into this pattern, which if you know anything about math or physics, this is a normal distribution or Gaussian, as a lot of people call it. A lot of people call it normal. A lot of people call it Gaussian. It's everywhere though, so it kind of is normal, isn't it? Now the thing about the Galton board is, let me see if I can get this. Uh, the main thing of this video is going to be I'm going to show how to simulate it, and I'm actually going to simulate it. But before I scare you off, uh, there's a lot to learn in this video about the Galton board because I have to explain how it works and go in depth on it. And so even if you're not interested in simulating stuff, uh, stick around for most of the video, I think, uh, could be something you're interested in. Well, the thing is about the Galton board is that it, it forms a normal distribution or a Gaussian, but it kind of doesn't. What it really forms is a binomial distribution because, as you see, the beads fall onto this peg here, this top middle peg, and then they'll either go left or they'll go right. As it gets extra windy out here, when you have two choices, left or right, that is a Bernoulli trial. If you can go left or right and you have a probability of going either way, that's called a Bernoulli trial. And if you do a bunch of those Bernoulli trials, then you create a binomial distribution. But what Sir Francis Galton figured out is that, well, he wanted to create this device to demonstrate the central limit theorem, which basically says that if you are making a binomial distribution but have a large enough sample size, it will form a normal distribution. That's what you were seeing, the, the sort of Gaussian curve there. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about the basics of the Galton board. Then I'm going to go, basically I'm going to explain with a bunch of words how I'm going to code the thing. Lastly, I'm going to actually code the simulation because it's actually really not hard. I'm going to assume that the beads that are falling, that they do not bounce and they do not miss pegs. Or they don't interact as well. When a bead hits a peg, there is a 50-50 chance of going left or right. Number three is a simple one. All the beads start at the same peg. Even though that's probably not true with the golden board, they might not start at the same one, they might miss the first one. The number of trials, so the Bernoulli trials, those left-right trials, is equal to the number of peg layers. So there are the four basic assumptions and principles that we need to know in order to simulate the Galton board. So this is my prompt to you now. If you know a little bit of coding and maybe you're interested in coding this, definitely right now try it out yourself. It's really not complicated. In my experience, if I'm simulating something, the best way to understand it is to do it myself. That might not be the case for everyone, but I've always opted to write my own code because I always get confused. It's like, I want to write it the way I want to write it. And so I recommend writing it the way you're comfortable. What you'll realize is that I'm not actually simulating the Galton board exactly because as you saw in the little videos I showed, the beads will bounce around and probably interact with each other quite a bit. I'm not exactly simulating the Galton board. So what I'm doing is simulating an ideal Galton board, which is very similar and it turned out a pretty good approximation to getting the Galton board. But what it does is it allows you to change some stuff. Once you actually simulate a Galton board, then you can change things. You could change the number of layers, you can change the number of beads you do, you could change all sorts of things. You could change the probabilities of going left and right. You can do all those sorts of things. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how I simulate the Galton board just with some words and some, you know, brilliant pseudo code with my absolutely brilliant setup because you can see me here and then I go over here and you can see me writing and then go back to me hopefully that'll work out in the edit so there's a couple steps you want to start with things like import packages which obviously depends on your language basically things for maybe arrays or plotting next you want to define your constants and your variables in the beginning so there's things like the number of beads and the number of layers. So those are important variables that you need to put in there. Big N, say, is equal to the 
number of steps. So let's say that's 100 or something. So a little hash, just move the comment in Python. So let's just do that. Number of steps. Then you also want to define your number of beads. How many beads do you want to do? Let's say a thousand or something. Maybe. Number of beads. Then you want to define your probabilities. In the Galton board case, it's 50-50. So P could be 0 0.5. Probability of going left. And then Q is probability of going right. So that is also 0.5, but I have a clever way of doing it. You can get what the probability of Q is by doing 1 minus P and then taking the absolute value. Now the thing is, you don't need to find Q for this, um, but I like to do it just in case you want to play with it somehow. Now those are the constants, and now we're going to get into the for loops that we need. Loop from 0 to n, where little n again is the number of beads. So I want to do this loop n times where each time I go through, I'm doing some tests for a bead, basically. Loop from zero to big N, where again, big N is the number of steps. So each time you loop through this first one, big N number of steps for that bead. Now what we want to do is generate some random number. R is a number between zero and one. So what this will allow you to do is you could change P to be say 0.3, and then Q would be 0.7, and then you could still do everything. And then so you could play around with it and change the probabilities. So this is just going to be some floating point decimal number. Now we want to do some if statements, OK? If r is greater than 0 and r is less than p, we want to do before this um, if statement, actually put something in here. It's something, it's a variable I'll just call position. What this does is for each bead, the position always starts out at 0. What this if statement is saying, that's referring to if you're going left. And so what you want to do is you want to iterate position by minus one. So you're just going left a little bit. Another if statement, else if r is greater than p and r is less than one, this is referring to when it's going right. So now you want to just do the opposite you did before. So now you're going to the right one. This should be before. So this should be on the same line as that. This is all in this loop, okay? So after this loop inside, put position in an array or a list, store it somehow to be used later. Because that's what you're going to plot. You're going to plot your positions, or you're going to histogram your positions. Is histogram a verb? I think it is. What I want to do is just make histogram with position. So you're going to, after each of these loops, you're going to have some position that you're going to put into an array. And then you're going to go through little n times, and you're going to fill this position array with bunch of positions. So when you go to make the histogram, you can just give it X or whatever you call your array. So there is one thing I wanted to explain before I move on to actually coding. Okay, so here we got a simple three layer Galton board where big N equals three. Say there's a little bead, it's falling down, starts at, at X equals zero. Then if he goes to the right once, he goes to X equals one. Then if he goes to the right once again, he goes to X equals two. And then once more, X equals three. Now what you'll notice is that you can only land in the bins, okay? You cannot land in between the bins. If you're thinking about all the possible X's that you can get, you can't get to all the X's. So in this case, X can equal negative 3, negative 1, 1, and 3. Not negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's, it's not that. There's only specific ones that you could get. And this is basically the same if you do choose an even big N. And notice that it's not every single value. It's only like every other value. What you're going to notice when you make your histogram is that you're going to have some empty bins. And that's okay. You don't see it in the golden board just because of the way we're defining X. I'm going to make a separate video about how to check the Galton board simulation that I'm making because you can't really you can probably get away with checking it with this uh, if you want but it's not really we're not really simulating this so you can't check the simulation with this normally I think you could check a simulation with data but this data is not really accurate to what we're actually simulating because we're assuming an ideal Galton board so I'll have links to that video involves some probability stuff because this is an inherent probabilistic process and so the solution uh, to compare to is going to be very probabilistic. So 
check that out if you want. Basically, in this simulation, I am simulating this sort of triangular bit in the Galton board. This extra stuff on the edges I'm not accounting for. So the furthest they would go in the simulation is along here and along here. They wouldn't go out here. And so I just wanted to further uh, note the difference between my simulation and the actual Galton board. So this just means the normal Gaussian distribution that we make is not going to go out as far, but it's still going to be a Gaussian. Here I have some code in Python. Now, I did say that I would type the code in the video, but I realized that that's probably not a good idea because the video is already so long. Uh, so I'm just going to go through it because it's really pretty simple. And so I'm just going to go through it and explain things line by line. So right at the top, we have the packages that I'm using. Matplotlib is for the histograms. Import random is for the line that does the random number generation from 0 to 1 which is random.uniform that I use. And then import math is for, uh, you'll run into some things where you might need it. Uh, in this case, math.ceiling, but that maybe that's, but you don't need that really. It's just a thing that I use. And then numpy, which I'm not sure what I use numpy for, uh, if I used it for anything. I don't think I used it for anything. All right, uh, just forget about that then. Um, but numpy is great as well. So one thing I want to note on that I did, earlier is I set, for example, big N equal to like 100, but in this I set it to N equals 12. So you probably want to stick to lower numbers like 12 or probably less than like 15, probably. My Galton board is N equals 12, so that's what I went for. But it turns out that if you increase big N, and this will be more clear in my second video where I go in depth into like the probabilities, that the higher big end you get, the less and less likely it is that you're going to find a bead out that far. If it was n equals 100, the chances of, you, of a bead getting out to, you know, 100 to the right is minuscule. It's so small. You're probably going to run into some errors if you try to do big n equals 100 or something, which I was doing. Little n, number of beads, I said 50,000, just a bunch because computers are fast, so might as well do that. P equals 0.5, and then Q is the absolute value of 1 minus P. Now here's what I did. I said X equals MP dot zeros. Oh, I do need NumPy. What am I doing? Arrays, yes. Uh, I want to put, I want to create an array of zeros. So this is just a long one-dimensional array of zeros. Basically an empty array of zeros. And then I'm just going to fill them in. And that's going to be size little n. So that's for each B. So I'm recording in that array a position, an end position. For each bead when it reaches the bottom of the golden board. So here we have the magical for loops. So if for i in range little n, so that is the uh, number of beads, right? I called it start one for some reason. Uh, whatever, that's position. Uh, maybe I'll change that. All right, I changed it to position. That was just a remnant of my research days where I didn't know what I was doing. Now you want to set the position equal to zero initially for each bead. So for each bead, the position is zero because it starts out at, you know, right in the middle at the top. And then for each bead, we do the second for loop, which loops over all the trials that a bead will go through. I'll call the rand. That's the random dot uniform between zero and one. So that's a random decimal floating point number between zero and one. And then I do this thing, which I outlined in the pseudocode of if it's between zero and P, then it you go left one. It's at left. Uh, it's too early. I don't know. It's at left. And then if it's between P and one, then you go right. And then once all of that is done in the for J loop over N, big N, then you put that position in, a hist in the array at uh, I. So I is the indice, the index number for the array. So that, do that for each bead, and then I have after both of these for loops, right at the end, right here, we have an array full of positions for beads, 50,000 of them at this point. Now here's the thing. Okay, so the, for setting the number of bins and the size of the bins, first I just said the width is one. So you could do it however you want. Really, you probably don't even need this width thing if you just want it to be width of one anyways. But I said width of one, fine. Number of bins. Now, ignore the ceiling thing, because that's whatever. But the important thing is you want the number of bins to be 
2 times n plus 1. Uh, if you want it to work out right, otherwise you're going to be really confused and it's going to like, you're going to be like, that doesn't look right. But it's 2n plus 1 as far as I can tell. What this does here is if you want to change the width of the bins, uh, you can do that. So if it were 2 for the width of the bins, then you divide by 2. Math.ceiling just gets the, the highest, you know, if it's 2.2, then I believe it gets 3. Or if it's 3.3, .3, it gets 4, right? It just goes to the highest integer value from that number. Or you could just do 2n plus 1 uh, if you want. It's fine. Here's the histogram part where I make the histogram. Um, in this case, I use plt.hist and give it x my ray and the bins, which is the number of bins I just calculated. Histogram contents is just the, the contents of each bin, and then the bins is, I think, the position of each bin. I don't even know what patches is. It just, so it wouldn't yell at me when it, you know, whatever. And then just label your stuff. And then you should be able to run it. I should be able to run it from here if I didn't make any changes that are bad. Okay, now we can run it. Uh, ignore the fact that my uh, file is in a .c file uh, directory, which, you know, it's not a .c file. It's because I'm lazy and I put it in the same thing as my, my .c files. Uh, anyways, moving on to running it. Wonderful. Okay, here we are. Here is our histogram where big N is 12. And you can see the most are at zero and it gets less and less as you go out. That being probably 12 right there on the edge is notice that there's these empty bins here, which I noted earlier because of how we're defining X. And so you could change your binage to uh, make those go away probably, but I didn't want to mess around with it. <laughs> so, but it shows you that, you know, you can't get to these. You can only get to the specific ones. Yeah, that's it. I'll, I'll show that it doesn't break down by changing and to something else. I think 14. Hopefully that's not pushing it. <laughs> yep, look at that. So it's a little further out. I think it's so small on the edges there that I'd have to run for more. Now it's time to test my code. Wait, I haven't tried this yet. I'm going to change to 0.3 and see what happens. Well, I'll change to 0.2 and see if hopefully it looks different. Oh yeah, look at that. Uh, so it seems to have shifted to the right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. right. <laughs> P is going left, it's probably going left, the probability goes down, uh, I think it's 0.2. So it's more likely that it's going to go to the right, and so that's why the whole thing has shifted to the right. Yeah, so you can change all these sorts of things. You can change steps, you can change speeds, you can change probabilities, whatever you want. I'll change that back to 0.5. And yeah, so if you want to, if you've tried this already and you figured it out, great. Uh, I think it's really interesting. Check out my other video if you're interested, where I go into checking the Dalton board the, uh, simulation that I made, and it goes a little bit more in depth. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, you leave a like if you want, or subscribe if you want to see more stuff, which hopefully I should be making more stuff uh, soon. Uh, but yeah, that's all I have for this. Check out my other video. Uh, but that's all I have. Bye.